So uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are around the world, and welcome to the uh, Matrix Online Seminar. Uh, today we have Jordi Williamson from the University of Sydney, who will speak about modular representation theory and, uh, and geometry. So geometry, uh, Jordi originally uh, studied in Sydney, uh, did a PhD in Freiburg and then a postdoc in Oxford and uh, Bonn at the Max Planck Institute before moving back to the University of Sydney, where he's now a professor. Uh, Jordi did some important work in geometric representation theory and was uh, awarded a few prizes. Uh, 2018 in particular was a, was a, a good year where he received uh, um, uh, several prizes, including um, uh, a, a talk at the ICM, uh, the Australian Mathematical Society Medal and the uh, youngest ever uh, fellow of the Royal Society. So it's our pleasure to have uh, Jordi speak in, in our online seminar. And um, before we go, um, I'd like to ask everyone to uh, put in questions if you have any in the Q&A box on, uh, in the screen on the at Zoom and we'll address all the questions at the end of the talk. Uh, so don't ask them via chat, but ask them via the Q&A. Uh, session. Also, I'd like to advertise upcoming Matrix online seminars. In September, we have Miranda Cheng from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Akshay Venkatesh, uh, another Australian speaker, will speak in October. And Peter Billman from ETH Zurich will speak in November. Okay, so uh, Jordi, over to you. Thank you. Um, um, I will just share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much for coming today. And um, also thank you very much to the Matrix team for organizing this wonderful seminar series. Uh, today, I will be talking about uh, modular representation theory and geometry. And really this talk is a peek at a very interesting new direction in representation theory, which um, we call higher representation theory. Um, this is a technical subject, um, and this is intended to be a colloquium style talk. And so I can only really give you a peek of this subject. Uh, but before we get to there, I just want to recall the basics of um, the fundamental definitions of representation theory. So we start off with a, a group. Um, for most of this talk, G will be a finite group, but at the beginning, I would like to G to be completely arbitrary. And a uh, representation uh, of G is a homomorphism. from G into the uh, endomorphisms of some vector space. For V over K a vector space. So one way of thinking about this is that we're asking in which ways can G arise as the symmetries of a vector space. And this representation is uh, simple if the only invariant subspaces are zero and V. It's, uh... Now, I think in mathematics, um, one can often say that in fields of mathematics, we have a mystery and a technique, a mystery and a tool. And in representation theory, the mystery is uh, our groups. Um, so the groups are ubiquitous in mathematics. And the tool is linear algebra. So linear algebra is a powerful tool. And so we have both a, a set of problems and a set, set of techniques for tackling them. Uh, 
And uh, I just wanted to give this very important basic example. If we consider um, the group um, S1, one of my favorite groups. So this is the set of complex numbers of norm one. So the circle, then the, um, the simple continuous reps representations of G are simply the maps that send a complex number to its nth power. And if we consider the, uh, so these particular functions are, we can see them as functions on the circle. And in fact, the L2 functions of S1, the complex L2 functions of S1 break up. This is essentially the theory of Fourier series into the multiples of these um, kind of Fourier coefficients. So on the left hand side, we have a general function on the circle, which we can see as a general periodic function if we want on the real line. And on the right hand side, we have its um, Fourier series. Okay, so this is the And I think it's useful in general to think about the irreducible or the simple representations of a group as being like the fundamental Fourier modes of that group, um, as evidenced by this, this example. So the, if we look historically, the importance of the group concept was realized at the beginning of the 19th century by Ruffini and Galois and others. And characters of abelian groups were used by extensively by Gauss and Dedekind and Dirichlet. So for example, when we study the um, Dirichlet's theorems in, in primes in arithmetic progressions, we use um, a character of an abelian group to define the Dirichlet L function. However, it took mathematicians nearly 70 years to realize how important representations of non-abelian groups are. And this was achieved by Frobenius in uh, 1896. He wrote the first paper on representations of groups within, which are not assumed to be abelian and he defined the character table. And then in the 20th century, we've discovered that representation theory and group theory is a fundamental notion throughout mathematics and theoretical physics. So a very inspiring friend of mine, Roman Bezrokamnikov, says that the first half of the 20th century was the realization that representation theory underlies, is a fundamental concept in theoretical physics through quantum mechanics and later the standard model. And in the second half of the 20th century, we realized that representation theory is a fundamental concept in number theory through the Langlands program. Uh, and just to give a few um, historical um, tidbits that I really like, um, here is the first character table ever published. This is uh, Frobenius's first paper on representations in 1896. Uh, so these are the representations of the um, alternating group on four letters, the symmetries of the tetrahedron. And here we fit, see the first uh, character table ever published, which, and this character table we would teach in a first year, in, sorry, in a first course on representation theory in, in third year, for example. Uh, here's a quote from Hermann Weil that I really love. The wish to understand what really is the mathematical substance behind the formal apparatus of relativity theory led me to the study of representations and invariants of groups. So after the second world, after, sorry, after the first world war, my understanding is that Hermann Weyl didn't really know what to do with himself mathematically. And at this point, general relativity had just come out and he was extremely excited by it. And he was trying to understand what was really underlying it mathematically 
and this led to an incredibly rich theory of representation theory of compact Lie groups, which Weil really championed. And the last little historical tidbit is this um, very inspiring paper of Langlands, which I would really recommend um, you read if you haven't read it before. Or I can read about the first half easily and then it gets tough, but uh, so it's talking about the role that representation theory took on through the Langlands program um, in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s, up to today. So this is um, just some background on representation theory. And I want to um, briefly discuss higher representation theory. So as I say, this will only be um, hinted at in this talk, but it's a very important current going behind, going on behind what I'm talking about today. So we can consider representation theory as being basically the study of vector spaces with symmetry. So, with certain fixed symmetries. So in this case, the endomorph um, symmetries take the form of endomorphisms. Um, and there's uh, a growing field uh, called higher representation theory. Which is the study of the symmetries of um, categories. So, of potentially higher categories with symmetries. So these, these would be endo functors now. So in representation theory, we ask ourselves, imagine that I have symmetry X and symmetry Y of a vector space. What can I say about the vector, this vector space? What extra structures does this give me on this vector space? Um, and in higher representation theory, we ask the same question, but now our endomorphisms X and Y are replaced by endo functors. And behind the scenes of this talk, is basically higher representation theory as a way of building bridges. So um, we consider categories of representations. So rather than asking, a, asking about a specific representation, we ask about all representations of a group at the same time. And in the title, this is modular representation theory and geometry. And so over here we have um, geometry. And by this, I mean um, things like the cohomology of algebraic varieties and also um, the world of constructible sheaves. And the results that I'll discuss at the end of the talk use a bridge between these two worlds, and that br this bridge is, is um, given by higher representation theory. And later on, I hope to give some examples where you see that this philosophy of studying endo functors on a category is a powerful one. And this, this might seem a little bit like uh, navel gazing in the sense that we start out as with some questions in representation theory and then we use higher representation theory to, to tackle them. Uh, but the techniques are very powerful and we also suspect that these techniques will go on to um, be fruitful in other areas of mathematics. So for example, they should be very powerful in algebraic geometry and they've all already been very proud, powerful in, um, in theory around the ge geometric Langlands, Langlands program. Uh, 
Okay, so now I'll take a step back and go back to the basics of, um, of representation theory. So from now on, I will assume that G is a finite group and soon we'll assume that G is the symmetric group. We fix a field K and if the characteristic of our field does not divide the order of our group, for example, if, um, if K is the field of complex numbers, then we have the semi-simple theory. This is the theory that we first learn. Um, so basic statements so are that every representation is isomorphic to a direct sum of simple representations. So this is called semi-simplicity. So this tells us that the building blocks of all our representations in, don't interact in any interesting ways. Um, once we understand the simple representations, we understand everything. We also have a count of the number of simple representations, the number of simples up to isomorphism is equal to the number of conjugacy classes. And moreover, these are kind of two, the, the notion of simple representation and conjugacy class are dual notions associated to our group and they're linked by the character table. Which you can think of being a kind of non-abelian Fourier transform. So for example, if you're studying functions on a group, um, when we're in, Fourier, in the theory of Fourier series, we're studying a function on S1 and we want to know uh, about that function. And so we use a, a um, Fourier expansion to understand our function. And in general, on, a, on for example, a finite group, if you have a invariant conjugation invariant function, you can think about writing it in terms of irreducible characters as something like the Fourier series of your function. And the character table is an enormously powerful thing and it basically reduces the, the study of your group to a square matrix, which is, uh, which is determined in many cases, it's a very powerful theory. And we saw the first example of that in this um, first paper of Frobenius. Um, the more complicated setting, this is um, the, the modular theory, is when the characteristic of K divides the order of our group. So this is the world of modular representations. And here, um, semi-simplicity fails. It always fails, it's never true. Uh, the number of simples is the number of um, P regular conjugacy classes. So that means conjugacy classes of elements whose order is not divisible by P. And here, um, I would say the theory, the semi-simple theory is well understood. Whereas in the modular theory, we have many open problems. And I would say that um, in the semi-simple theory, the reason that it is so useful is because it is rather simple and well understood. Whereas the modular theory is, is very powerful because it's, it seems to be a very deep and difficult, difficult world. Uh, and even the most basic questions um, still elude us. <laughs>
I just want to give you one example of um, a question that arises in modular representation theory, which is kind of typical of a whole lot of questions which are called lo local global questions. Um, so there's a typo here. So we can take our group, we can take our finite group G, and we can take a prime, and we can ask for the number of simples um, such that P does not divide the dimension. And so we get a number associated to our group. Now, another thing we can do is take a seal of P subgroup of our group, look at its normalizer, and perform the same count. And the Mackay conjecture is that these numbers are always equal. And apparently, um, I'm not sure if this is true, but um, this was very close to the time where Mackay made the famous monstrous moonshine observation, Mackay and Conway. But I was told that he first observed this on the monster, simple group. Um, so this is a, this is called the Mackay conjecture and it's an example of one of these very innocent looking simple statements about finite groups that people have tried enormously hard to prove over the last 40 years um, and have not been successful. So this, this conjecture was recently proved for the prime P equals two by, uh, Mala, by Gunter Muller and Britta Spät. Uh, and it uses, for example, the classification of finite simple groups. So such an innocent statement um, for, is unknown for any prime except for the prime two. And when the prime is two, we need the classification of finite simple groups, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, and just to kind of motivate where the title comes from, namely modular representation theory and geometry, I want to make the following analogy that might sound um, might sound kind of coming out of nowhere at this point, but it turns out to be extremely useful. That if we have a group G, so we fix a finite group, and then we imagine the fields where we're studying this group is varying. So as K varies, as our the, the field over which we are representing our group varies, um, the category of representations of, of G in that characteristic is uniform and semi-simple except for a finite number of characteristics. where interesting behavior occurs. So in some sense, it's rather boring for most, for most primes, but there's certain primes where interesting behavior occurs. And so in some sense, all of the behavior is just like C for almost all characteristics, but then there's certain characteristics where interesting stuff shows up. Now, there's a, similar, there's a similar kind of phenomenon in algebraic topology, which is I could have a finite family of spaces of finite types. So I'm thinking, for example, finite CW complexes or algebraic varieties or something like that. And as K varies, um, the cohomology of X with values in K looks the same um, as over C, so there'll be a finite number of characteristics where suddenly. The, these cohomology groups where there's torsion, the, the, where there's torsion in the cohomology. So when, when we take some prime, this will suddenly show up and the cohomology will look different at a cert, for a certain um, fields. 
but this will be a finite number of amount of kind of interesting behavior in a sea of uniformity. And there's another parallel here in number theory where um, if we look at, for example, um, a number field, then this will be this will be ramified. This will be ramified at certain primes, and then for the rest, for the rest of the primes, there's some kind of uniform behavior. So for the rest of this talk, I want to focus on the symmetric group. So we might also teach this in a first course on representation theory, that the simple representations of Sn are parameterized by partitions. So partitions is increasing. And uh, so in this particular case, before I said that there's this um, bijection between that, so that the, the count of simple representations and conjugacy classes is the same, but it's very important that this is not, there's no canonical bijection, but in the case of the symmetric group, there really is. So conjugacy classes and representations are both canonically parameterized by partitions of N. And so we would write this diagram as, we would write this partition as some um, young diagram where we have lambda one, lambda two, lambda three rows. And an exam example of this bijection, so the trivial representation corresponds to the one row partition and the sign representation namely that that sends any permutation to its sign. To this, um, this partition. And this was all worked out by Frobenius in 1900, uh, four years after he discovered the character table. I find it absolutely remarkable that he was able within four years to develop the theory to the extent where it was able to do the case of the symmetric group. And there's a, a modern way of um, understanding this picture due to a Kunkov and Vershik, which um, I absolutely love. And it's a first example of um, higher representation theory. So it's the following picture where we consider all symmetric groups at once. So, S1 sits inside S2, sits inside S3. Where we include um, S3 as the permutation, inside S4 as the permutations that only permute one up to three. Okay, kind of first, the first inclusion of symmetric groups you would have ever look at. And now we consider all categories of representations of these symmetric groups at once. And we can draw the following picture. So we consider the representations of S1. So S1 is the trivial group. So this is just the category of vector spaces. So this is the category of, um, so S2 has two representations, the trivial representation and the sign representation. So this is um, two copies of, of vector spaces. Um, et cetera. And now between these categories, we have induction and restriction functors based on this chain of inclusion. So we can do induction. And there's beautiful formulas for how these functors act on 
uh, irreducible representations. So the restriction of the irreducible given by this this young diagram is just all ways of removing precisely one box so that we still have a young diagram. So here's what we get. Okay, so notice here the first one is when we remove this box, the middle one's when we remove this box, and the final one's when we remove this box. And induction um, is similar. It's all ways of adding one box so that you still get. And um, on Grothen D groups, we get a so-called Fox space representation of a Heisenberg Lie algebra. So I'm not um, assuming that you know what this means. Um, but there's um, a particularly important Lie algebra, the, the Heisenberg Lie algebra, which has a particularly important. Um, representation, namely Fox space. And this Fox space shows up in this apparently very different world of um, representations of the symmetric group. And given this, we can think about this as being a kind of categorical Heisenberg. Action. So I don't want to make this precise, but uh, what, what we have here is a, is a big category, namely the sum of all of these categories of representations. And we have um, two very interesting functors acting on this category, namely the direct sum of all these induction functors and the direct sum of all these restriction functors. And these, these functors um, give us an extremely interesting way of moving in this category um, which can be thought of as a kind of categorical lift of an important representation in the theory of Lie algebras. Okay. And it turns out that with this very basic picture, I mean, I would very much recommend reading this um, paper of Kunkov and Vershik, which is called A New Approach to the Representation Theory of Symmetric Groups, I think. But um, we're just with this picture in mind and and of course, some ingenuity, but not too much. You can develop all of the theory of, um, of the symmetric group that we would teach in a first course. So the standard, standard tableau characters, et cetera. Okay. This is the first hint that this um, higher representation theory is a useful point of view. Um, and we can also pursue this in the modular setting um, now the road gets much steeper, it's much more complicated. And it turns out that here we can, um, if we consider E to be the um, direct sum of all these, um, so E is the restriction functor. So it turns out that it has a canonical decomposition into um, sub -functors. So what this means is that if I apply the restriction functor to any representation of Sn, then it decomposes in a functorial way as Fp different sum ends over here. And similarly, we have um, a decomposition of the induction functor, also indexed by Fp. So these are decompositions of functors. So just as I might realize that an operator that I'm using can be naturally written as a direct sum of, diff of p different op operators, here I'm realizing that a functor can be written as a direct sum of functors, decomposition of functors. And this gives a um, categorical representation 
of SLP hat, so an affine Lie algebra. So this is a really remarkable story. This, these affine Lie algebras um, first came to prominence in, for example, in conformal field theory. Um, and it's difficult from a non-physics um, point of view to really convince a pure mathematician that these are um, things that they should spend their life studying. Um, and I find it really remarkable that in this setting of modular representations of the symmetric group, if you didn't know what an affine Lie algebra was, you would be forced to discover it through this picture. This, these decompositions are very natural, and so you would rediscover this affine Lie algebra. Uh, and I want to briefly go over um, the connection to geometry. So this, this will be um, rather sketchy. So what we consider is the following uh, quiver. So this is a quiver with P nodes cyclically orient oriented. So you can think of them as indexed by the um, residues mod P. And you have an arrow from I to I plus one mod P. And then we consider the space of nilpotent representations of Q or technically the stack of nilpotent representations of Q. So this means I consider all ways of putting vector spaces at each of these vertices together with arrows, such that if I go around enough, I get zero. And what this higher representation theory is, so basically what you realize is that um, both sides here are categorical representations of, SL, of SLP hat. So I explained briefly why that's the case on the, over this side, and similar calculations show it over this side. And then the theory tells you how to build a bridge between these. And I don't want to go over what this arrow means in detail, but basically it means that if I understand enough about this space, I can answer any question I would like to answer about the representation theory of symmetric groups, mod P representation theory of symmetric groups. So um, the moral is that the kind of singularities of this control um, the modular representations of And this bridge is established by a higher representation theory. Okay, so um, I probably should have mentioned by now that we know very little about the representation theory of symmetric groups and characteristic P. This is one of these basic questions about which we know very little. And this perspective is very powerful. Um, I mean, it's very powerful in the sense that we still don't know anything, but we know a, a tiny little bit more than what we knew before. So what I want to illustrate is, um, is this billiards conjecture, which um, I formulated with um, George Lustig about um, two to three years ago, which is basically about, so what we can do is we can take a representation of the symmetric group. And we can realize this rep so over, over C and we can realize this representation via integral matrices. And now we can reduce mod P. And we can ask questions about that representation. For example, how often does the trivial representation occur in a composition series? So this is an example of a decomposition number. And if we understood enough about decomposition numbers, then we would understand, for example, um, we would be able to describe all the simple representations of symmetric groups and characteristic P. And currently we cannot um, describe decomposition numbers. But what this billiards conjecture is about is a description of decomposition numbers uh, for three row partitions. So, uh, and basically what it says is that these decomposition numbers are given by a discrete dynamical system. So I want to show you a video in a little while. 
Um, but before I show you the, show you a video, um, I need some preparations. So uh, the first preparation is that I should admit that our conjecture is slightly wrong, um, as was discovered by my student Tolga Jensen this year, um, following some software that we spent um, quite a lot of time working on together. Uh, so basically this billiards conjecture came about by taking seriously this point of view of higher representation theory and this connection to, um, to singularity theory and um, programming things on supercomputers and letting them run for months. And so we got a whole lot of data um, and stared at this data for nearly a year and were able to see a pattern. Um, and our data at that point, we were able to go up to about 90 or some parameter, the parameter was about 90. Uh, and um, we then improved the software significantly. We were able to go a little bit further and see that our conjecture fails in a very subtle way just beyond where we've got to. But anyway, that's the um, caveat for the experts. Um, so here's a picture of uh, what decomposition numbers look like for two rows. So here I take a two row representation of the symmetric group and I reduce it modulo P. And basically, you can imagine that two row partitions are indexed by certain, they're linearly ordered. Um, you can in index them just by 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. For example, the, um, the length here. Okay, this just gives me a way of parameterizing two row partitions. And so I can plot when I reduce this modulo P, which, um, which uh, irreducibles occur. And basically what happens here is I get the columns of this picture. So, so I get the, this picture, a truncation of this picture and I get the columns of this picture. And you'll see that we get these beautiful fractal patterns and that's part of the fascination with this subject. Okay. But this, is, this, was, this was understood, um, I guess in the nineties, this picture. Um, I want to show you this video, which uh, involves three row partitions. And there's a way of indexing all three row, row partitions, which could possibly involve the trivial representation when we reduce the mod P by, by this alcove picture. Um, so if you know this subject, what I'm using is sure value duality and um, some representation theory of SL3. And if you don't know, th know that, just believe me that there's some way of indexing all of the partitions that could possibly involve the trivial representation when I reduce the mod P by um, these alcoves. And so what we can do is we can just take all these representations, reduce the modulo P and then ask how often, for example, does the trivial representation occur? So this would be an example um, for the prime P equals three if I reduce this one modulo P, I don't get any copy of the trivial representation. Whereas for these ones, I, I get one copy and for this particular one, I get two. And what our software was doing was working out very precisely what these numbers were. Um, far beyond what was possible using um, current technology. Okay. Um, so now I want to show you this video, which basically what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, plot this picture for all symmetric groups at once. And the, the symmetric group parameter is like the time parameter. So you'll see one slide, which is one symmetric group. Then the next slide is the next symmetric group. The next slide is the next symmetric group. Okay. So I'll just pause the video for a second. So I hope everyone can see this. Uh, so you can't read it, but down in the, um, I don't have my highlighter anymore, but um, you'll see that there's a little shadow running along the diagonal, um, which, is the, uh, which is the symmetric group that we're in. So we're currently in S57. And what you see is that these decomposition numbers appear to satisfy 
a kind of beautiful billiards pattern. Okay, so I'll just go back. Um, Okay, so just to be clear, this is saying, uh, I mean, it's a bit annoying to, um, to not have a pointer, but these, these dots are indicating occurrences of the it's, uh, modules for which the trivial module occurs in them when we reduce mod P. Okay. And um, so this, uh, currently the prime is 17. And uh, yeah, it seems to me kind of totally remarkable that putting all these symmetric groups together um, and using the symmetric group parameter as a time parameter, we get this thing that looks billiard-like. Um, we have no idea why this should be the case. Um, and yeah, so we would love to understand what structures are behind this behavior. And um, I guess the dream um, is to understand uh, this, for, for all symmetric groups and, and understand the representation theory of symmetric group modulo P in general, but that's a long, long way off. Um, so thank you all very much for listening. All right, thanks very much, Jordi. Let me uh, sort of clip on behalf of everyone. Uh, it's a very cool visualization as someone remarked already in the chat. So, um, we can we have a bit of time to answer questions. There's a Q and A tab at the at the at the bottom of your screen, and if you enter your questions there, then Jordi can read them and answer them. So uh, the first one, Jordi. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, Katie asks, can this theory be developed for representations of the infinite symmetric group? Um, the the group of permutations of the set of, set of naturals. Uh, I, all I can say to that is it's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, particularly Vershik has been involved um, with absolutely beautiful applications of the representation theory of the infinite symmetric group. Um, I guess the issue for me is that I already really struggle with small symmetric groups. Um, so the, the prospect of going to Yes, infinity is a little bit daunting, um, but it's possible that something magical happens there. Um, so, um, the next question, which I don't understand, I must admit. So, BLW asks, what are those geometries arising from modular representations, new or old? Um, BLW, if you're able to clarify your question, I can have a go at answering it. I don't really know what you mean. Um, Quixian Zhao asks, how does the higher representation theory point of view relate to the billiards conjecture? It's, thank you for the question. That's an excellent question. Um, basically, I would say at this point, higher representation theory provides us with a bridge to get to a place where we can compute enough to see billiards. Um, but I think that we don't yet understand what is the structure behind billiards. Um, and I feel sure that it will, will be of a higher representation theoretic nature, but we don't, don't know. Um, I don't think I need my screen anymore, so I might stop sharing this screen um, and then go on to the other questions. Ah, um, okay. Uh, so what is she FP? So I use the notation SH sub FP. This is my cheating notion, uh, notation for the derived category of sheaves of FP spaces. So um, it's sheaves of FP vector spaces on this stack that I was calling script um, curly N. Um, so it's the category of sheaves 
which sees questions about torsion and things like things like that. Um, Gautam asks, are there interesting results known for easier non-abelian groups other than SN? Uh, that's another excellent question. So I would say that there's no interesting family of groups for which we understand their modular representations. Um, so there's been a lot of work, for example, on the groups of Lie type, um, finite groups of Lie type, um, both so if I have a finite group of Lie type, um, I can look at its representation theory both in its characteristics. So if I'm looking at, for example, I don't know, GLNFP, I can look at its representation theory in characteristic P and in characteristic L. These are very different theories, um, but both are very interesting. Uh, we don't understand very much um, yeah, so there's a web of very fascinating questions, uh, but yeah, there's no um, really good general family of groups for which we understand the answer, which is probably why we're focusing on symmetric groups at this point. Um, so Alexander Campbell asks, how high are the higher categories involved in higher representation theory? Do infinity categories play a role? Um, yeah, so for me, um, this stops at um, two categories, but for others, it goes all the way up to infinity and probably I'll get dragged up there at some point too. Um, I guess, yeah, that's probably the best way I can answer that question. Um, but for example, people like Ben Svi and Nadler, um, work extensively in the infinity category world. Um, David Roberts asks, does passing to the family of alternating groups impact the known results and or conjectures? Um, so here I'm not an expert. My understanding is that, uh, my, my understanding is that they're basically the same question. Um, for alternating and symmetric groups. So if you could answer one, you could answer the other, and we end up focusing on symmetric groups. But I don't think that there's a major simplification um, obtained by passing to alternating groups. I'm not an expert. Um, here the expert is probably Sasha Kleschke. Um, Grishan Zhao asks, um, how does or does it at all geometry enter the picture of higher representation theory and billiards conjecture apart from the conceptual apart from the conceptual analogies that there are only finitely many exceptions as the base field varies? Um, well, I mean, I would say that we the the only way that we can calculate is via this bridge to geometry. Um, So, uh, so it's, it's utterly unclear to us what the geometric meaning of the billiards conjecture is. Um, that we have no idea, but if it weren't for geometry, we, we, would, we could have never made the conjecture. I hope that's clear. Um, Alex Gitzer asks, are there direct non-geometric Langlands arithmetic applications of higher representations? Uh, I think yes. Um, so one example, uh, which I don't understand particularly well, but is still very dear to my heart, is the work of Vincent Lafogue establishing um, the local Langlands correspondence for um, function fields for any, for any group. Um, so this is a really fascinating story, um, but the one of the really fascinating aspects, so I, I hope that Alex Gitzer agrees that the local Langlands correspondence is a fundamental thing in arithmetic. This is not a kind of geometric Langlands thing. This is really a, an arithmetic thing that people in arithmetic care about. Um, and the only proof 
passes through um, something called the geometric Sotake correspondence, which is really exists in the world of um, higher representation theory. And now there's a proposal for famous proposal now of, um, of Farg to take the um, Laforgue's proof um, and phrase it on the um, Farg Fontaine curve and get the, sorry, I mean, the Laforgue work is the um, Langlands correspondence for, for function fields for any group. And it's a direction of the Langlands correspondence. Um, apologies, I, I didn't state that correctly, but I think I just stated it correctly then. Um, but now there's a proposal of FAG which has been carried out by FAG Scholzer, which involves transplanting this technique to actually get the local Langlands correspondence over, um, over periodic fields, which I think anyone in arithmetic would love to see. Um, I think there's other examples which we can discuss perhaps privately, um, if you would like to. Um, Christopher Hone asks, how does the geometric theory look different over base fields FQ for Q a prime power? Is the geometric side sensitive to field of definition type questions? This is an excellent question. Um, there's questions of, um, of, so basically if I have a finite group, then I might need to extend my field a little bit in order for, um, for um, complete reducibility to hold. But once I've done so, then nothing changes un under further extensions. And um, I was tacitly assuming throughout the talk that I've already performed this small extension. So people in finite groups will require their field to be big enough for all groups concerned and I'm doing this. Um, this issue doesn't show up for symmetric groups where everything is already completely reducible. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry, I said completely reducible before, I meant absolutely irreducible. Um, where, so for symmetric groups, everything is absolutely irreducible over the prime field. And so there's no subtlety in um, extension of the base field. Um, Path asks, can you explain again when the conjecture fails? Um, it's very subtle. Um, basically, if I can describe it roughly as saying that in this picture, we have all these, all these balls. And uh, basically, the way that that is illustrated and the way that it appears is that once balls separate, they never, they never join again. Um, and Torgi Jensen discovered that in certain cases, um, they do join again on walls. Um, it's, it's rather technical. Um, and uh, I guess we have to wait for Torga's paper for a precise, he has a precise reformulation of what the conjecture should be. And it's very close to the original conjecture. Um, what, so Arindam asks, what are the general techniques to show that a representation is irreducible in mod P theory? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I wish I could answer that better. Um, uh, it's tough. Um, I mean, on a computer, there's things called meat acts and things like that that are very good at um, proving. So that's a kind of question in algorithmic, in computational representation theory. Um, in our world, often we have a form on something in characteristic zero, and we can prove that the radical of this form is the maximal submodule when we reduce mod p. And I'd say that's the most useful general technique. Um, yeah, but beyond that, it's a tough one. Um, so thank you. All right, thanks very much, Jordi, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, we do have a few more um, Matrix Online seminars coming up. Um, and there will be one in next month by Miranda Cheng from the University of Amsterdam. Goodbye, everyone, and thanks again, Jordi. Oh, I, should, I, I forgot to say this, this talk is recorded and will be available on the, via the Matrix website soon after the talk. Okay, goodbye, everyone.